Okay. See, Judy, you should be able to come in here. Judy, are you there? Judy? Yes, ma'am. I'm right here. Yeah, we're, we're terrific. Okay. So Perfect. back to what I was saying about taxes. Um, I've heard everything from not taxable event to put aside 50%. I'm pretty sure that at this point my husband and I have decided we are going to set up a separate account, put away 50%. It's a good idea. If it's taxed, you got it covered. If it's not, you have a bonus. Exactly. But, you know, until, as Jim would say, the official rules of engagement are made known, we just recommend putting all these rumors aside and just be ready. You know, we, we are trying to get you ready by teaching you about trusts. Many of you, fortunately, have your trusts in place. Some of you do not yet, and we hope that um, you're going to be able to do that quickly. So, Judy, we've got some questions. Would you like to get started? Yes, ma'am, I surely would. Just give me one little second here. Um, the question that I hear a lot my, that I, from people that I've brought in, into the opportunity are why do we establish a trust rather than continue owning the currency in our own name or social security number? Well, anything you own in your own name and social leaves your assets exposed. And okay. I, I know this is an extreme example, but if you were to exchange in your own name and have a heart attack or accident on the way home, all that money would be at risk. It would be taxed at the federal rate of 40% after the $5.49 million exemption. And probably most of us are going to have more than $5 million. But the assets can be tied up in court for years. Your family may never, ever see it, or it won't be for a long, long time. Having assets in your own name also leaves you wide open for lawsuits and others wanting to part, you to part with your newfound wealth. On the other hand, if you exchange your into a properly crafted trust and then have an accident or heart attack, the assets remain in the trust with no probate and no estate taxes. It will be managed by the successor trustee that you previously named. So you've made for a logical management and succession of those assets by putting into a trust beforehand. Okay. What happens if somebody doesn't have the funds in place to have a trust before the exchange? If they put it in their own name, while they're waiting for their trust to be set up, is that okay? Well, it's not ideal, but if they don't have right. the money, you don't have the money. Um, right. I, at this point, I would suggest have everything ready. Let me know. You know, I'll send you an application. You can have your application all filled out and ready to go. And as soon as you have the money, just call me or email me. And granted, we're going to be really busy. And right now, turn around. Um, new trust is typically, you know, three or four or five days. Right. But after that, it's going to be a little bit longer. Right. So, so could probably, somebody exchange one note to get some breathing room and then wait until they get their trust and then exchange the rest after that? Do you think that's advisable? Well, that has been suggested. Right. But it's also, I've also heard from other circles, we may not have the opportunity to do yeah, that. I, I, yeah, okay. So, I mean, I... I I mean, I think it's a great idea. That's something I planned on doing initially myself. But um, I don't know that we're going to have that opportunity just to cash okay. in or exchange. One okay. Or Unless maybe, you know, they talk about, you know, have somebody else do it. Like, you know, have your have your, your, your kid do it, your, your adult child do it for you. But the public is probably not going to – know about this. We, as our Internet people that are keeping our, our nose to the grindstone, as, it will, as you will, um, are going to probably know about this before the public does. So there, go, <clears throat> excuse me, there goes that opportunity for you to send your son into the bank with a 25K note. So we're right. just going to have to play that one by ear. <clears throat> okay. All right. So there's a lot of talk out there about other kinds of trust. Why is a business trust so superior? Well, most other trusts are statutory in nature, meaning that they get their power and strength from locally, usually state enacted laws. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they're often recorded in that state or county, thus you have no privacy. And they're sometimes required to pay a state recording fee every year. Uh, that's also true of most corporations, LLCs, and statutory trusts. The thing is, with our trust, it's common law. 
It gets its power and benefit from the U.S. Constitution, which itself is a common law contract. Oh, oh, that's, oh, that makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah, and states that require recordation, there aren't a lot of them to begin with, but they typically require recordation of the trust only if the trust is actively involved in commerce, which people have done for years. And a lot of people, their businesses are set up as trusts, and that's the only time it is uh, registered with the state. Like my business, Indicator Information, is registered with the state of Washington. But I have other trusts that are not, ones that are that are waiting waiting to be able to use with this RV. So, uh, for the purposes of of you all and your trust, they do not have to be registered. Okay. So, um, why are business trusts so ideal in controlling versus personally owning assets? Well, at the very beginning, we talked about. Uh, Asset protection. Asset protection. Why, you know, why, why, why can't I just go cash in my own name? So those, those same things come into play. Okay. okay. You, there's okay. a possibility that you might not have them, but as a creation of the business trust, you irrevocably exchange your assets, in this case your currency, into the business trust. You no longer own those assets, but you have complete autonomy in managing them. You don't own them, so nobody can take them from you. That's uh, rule number one of good estate, uh, estate planting. Judy? Yeah, I'm right here. I'm just listening to you. I'm, t- I'm actually taking a couple of little notes as I'm listening oh. to you. So why aren't the banks and attorneys and CPAs more familiar with business trust? I, I've had that experience myself, as have several of my friends. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, it's common law. Common, common law. law is rarely taught in our colleges and universities anymore. Some attorneys are familiar with Massachusetts business trusts, but you know, once in place, they don't make any money from them. I mean, I've heard it said that the file cabinet full of revocable living trusts are the attorney's retirement package uh, because you have to go back for this, you have to go back for that, uh, writing minutes. Uh, taking care of it when somebody dies, et cetera, et cetera. With a business trust, you buy it from us, it's done. And if, yeah. if you do want any additional work done, okay, maybe a couple hundred bucks. But uh, it's not what we do, not what we plan on. Right. So down the road, it, once we have the trust all set up, then um, we learn how to live in them, learn how to control them, and then they, they get passed down to our, to our trustees. To your successor trustees. And that's, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Somebody mentioned to me, well, you're only going to be in business for six months after this happens, so what happens then if we have questions? But, Judy, as you just said, you learn to live in them. You learn how to work with them. You learn and, how, that's our job. That's our, yeah. that's our job. Exactly. I mean, you're going to learn how to manage all this money. You're going to learn how to operate within the trust. In all right. the years that my husband and I have been selling business trusts, it's been rare that we've had anybody call with questions or concerns, even as far as six weeks later. I mean, I talk to people frequently, and, you know, they might buy new trust or they might refer some people to me, but very, very rarely do they run into a question like that that they can't figure out. And we, we do give you, as most of you know, give you complete operating instructions and legal backup. Right. There you go. Great. So what's the difference, Carol, between an irrevocable and a revocable trust? An irrevocable trust is just what it says, irrevocable, cannot be changed or revoked. You exchange those assets, period. They are no longer yours. A and that's, trust, that's what the business trust is, it's business irrevocable. Trust is irrevocable, yeah. Okay, On the other it. hand, a revocable trust can be changed or terminated at any time. And because of this, the IRS can and may invoke something they call the clawback provision, putting right. your assets back into your estate where they can be added to your personal estate. It's a very important consideration at tax time, uh, whether or not those assets are somewhere irrevocably or, oh, they're there, I can take them out if I want to. So uh, being irrevocable in this case is a very, very good thing. It it's, makes perfect sense for the kind of money that we're all talking about, uh, protecting for generations. So I, get, I understand that. So 
Um, there are two kinds of business trusts, as I understand it from, from hearing you and reading things, it, a pure or a complex trust and an associated type. What's the primary difference between them? Which one do we get from you? Well, what you get from us is a pure trust, and that is one that's managed solely by the trustee. Oh, okay. Yeah, an associated trust and one which the beneficiaries have a say in the management of the trust. Well, this trust doesn't even have beneficiaries. We have certificate holders, and once you exchange your assets into the trust, you become a certificate holder, okay? Okay. You are also the trustee, but you're wearing different hats. I mean, let's, let's do another for instance. Um, you passed on your, let's say, your adult daughter is your successor trustee, but you've already made provision. Okay, I want my granddaughters to have certificates because I might, you know, my, yours become null and void upon your death. So you want your daughter to have some, yes, but you want your granddaughters to have some also. Okay. She is still going to be the, the trustee. She's the only one that has any say in the management of that trust. Your granddaughters are taken care of financially but they don't have any say in the management of the trust. That's what a pure trust is. Okay, so my granddaughters have a certificate that they get on the event, on the when I pass. Yes. How do they? How could they t- take the certificate and get and turn it into cash? They can't. So what does the certificate mean to them? The certificate means to them that. If the trustee, your daughter, decides to make a distribution, okay, let's say the trust has made all this money just in interest in the last year. Okay. Make a distribution to the certificate holder. So she's got Oh, these, wow. I got 25 it. 25 units, and, and you have three grandchildren. They all have 25 units. So they're all going to get a pro rata share of whatever distribution the trustee decides to make. But the grandchildren, in order to receive that, need to be certificate holders as well. That's correct. Is there a limit to how many certificates a trust can have? Yeah, it's limited to 100. Oh. 100 See? units. You're yeah, so, yeah. brilliant, so Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's 100 trust certificate units. And initially, okay. when you get your trust, if you are a single investor or exchanger, you get all 100. If you were a couple, you get 50, and your spouse, and your spouse gets 50. But you know, in later on future generations, that number, that ratio is going to change because your certificate becomes null and void upon your death. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So, wow, that's a lot of powerful information. Excellent. Well, so that's a good place. Maybe we should stop there and see if we have any questions. I, I was just thinking the same thing. We're reading each other's mind. Okay, we are on Q&A, folks. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and let us know what you're thinking. As we are going through this kind of quickly. So we can continue, Judy, and I'll let you know if anybody comes in with a question. Okay, great. So what's the business of our business trust? Well, I'm going to let you answer that one because I think you know. I do know, <laughs> because I have a good teacher. It's, it's to be able to ex- receive and then exchange the foreign currency that we hold. We're putting well, it into the trust. The reason you got it, but the business of your business trust is very, very simple. It's estate planning. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, estate planning. Oh, yeah, I didn't get far enough estate planning. Protect your assets yeah. and estate planning, estate yeah. Planning, yeah, because, you know, whether we have – major, major estates like we're all hoping to have, or we have smaller estates like many of my customers from 20 years ago, it's still estate planning. You're trying to take care of what you have, make sure that your children get it without taxes and without, you know, probate and that kind of stuff. So that is the business of your business trust. Okay, awesome. Now, um, folks are calling. Are are folks calling and asking about being their own trustee? Is this legal? Yeah, it it seems to be a sticking point with a lot of people because in typical statutory trust, you cannot be your own trustee. Right. And that's what we've all heard. Well, you can't be your own trustee. You can't be your own trustee. I mean, I remember going to trust meetings years ago. Oh, you can't be your own trustee? Well, yeah, you can because of the way the trust is written. Our business trust is not a statutory trust, but it's a contract. 
contract and trust. If you to determine what you can and cannot do, you have to look within the four corners of the contract, and it is clearly spelled out, spelled out that the creator can pick any adult person of his or her choosing to be the trustee. That's, and it's a fiduciary relationship. And the way we feel is you are the one that was able to put these assets together, whatever they may be, whether it's dinar or it's, you know. Real estate. Or, or you know, your, your um, a collection, your art collection, whatever. You are the one that was able to put those assets together. And you are the most likely person to be able to continue to take good care of them. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. So. Okay, so having heard you say that, then how do you get your assets into a business trust versus other kinds of trusts? Well, typically, in, in a, you can, to move assets, period, you can gift them, sell them, exchange them, or sign them. Statutory trusts are typically grantor trusts, which means you give those assets to the trust. With a business trust, you exchange your assets. As I said just a, a minute ago, when you exchange your assets into the trust, you get back uh, certificates of undeterminable value. What you're putting in is an undeterminable value. What you get back is undeterminable value. That makes it a non-taxable event. So I think that's worth repeating, so people might want to make a note of that, Carol. That was pretty powerful. Okay. So when you exchange your assets, in this case your currency, right? trust, and I say you exchange. If you exchange, you get something back. What you're getting back are the certificates, which we talked about a moment ago. Right. They are the evidence of the exchange, and they're both of an undetermined value. I mean, you tell me you have dinar and, and dong and zim, but I don't ask you how much, right? Right. You're going to exchange it for certificates of undetermined value. Got That's, it. Therefore, it's a not the exchange it is a non-taxable event. So Brilliant. No, okay, so there's no tax <laughs> to begin with at, at, at all, at all. I okay. still got everybody on Q&A, folks, if anybody has a question. Okay. You're such a good teacher, Carol. <laughs> Thank you, sweetie. Okay, so once we're inside the trust, how do we enjoy the benefits of taking money out of it or use these funds uh, and income with the least amount of personal taxation? Well, there's actually several ways to get money out. Um, for big ticket items, I know most people are planning on buying a new home and stuff like that. If you were to take out half a million dollars or a million dollars for a new house, that would be taxable to you. However, think about how you would typically buy a new home. You'd borrow the money. In this case, you're not going to ABC Mortgage Company. You're going to your own trust. So you're going to borrow the money from your trust to purchase that house or to purchase a new car or, or even take out $100,000 because you just want to play around for a year. You're going to borrow that money. And again, being because it's a loan, it's not a taxable event. So, and you know, make it reasonable. And then how do you pay it back? Monthly like a mortgage on the, in the case of a house? You can do whatever terms you're comfortable with. But I would get, uh, I'd get a standard promissory note. You do have to have, back this up with a promissory note that will become part of your trust. But make it like a 10-year balloon note with 2% interest. I see, I see. It's only payment at once a month, once a year, whatever. And at the end of 10 years, you can roll it over and do it for another 10 years. Okay, so what what happens if, let's, I'm going to use myself as an example. I want to buy a house that's a million dollars. And is it possible that the trust, or if I set up a, another trust solely for the house, that the main trust could send the million to the house trust to pay for it so there's no balloon notes or anything or payments due? Is that possible? Send money to the house trust. Pardon me? Okay, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to disseminate your question here. So I want to buy a house that costs a million dollars. I don't want to set up a promissory note. I don't, want to, I don't want to take a loan from my trust. I want to buy the house in another entity, and I want my trust to put the money in the entity to pay for it. Okay. Is that possible? Yes. You're going to form 
your initial trust, let's call it your ABC trust, okay. is going to be the exchanger into XYZ trust. Okay. Got it. And XYZ then can go pay cash for the house. That's correct. And it's Perfect. not a loan, because don't forget, when you, your initial exchange, like we just talked about, is not a taxable event. So ABC Trust becomes the exchanger and then the certificate holder of XYZ Trust. So you as a trustee are going to go buy that house in the name of XYZ Trust. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not certain. I think I feel like I'm missing one little blank. Um, it... It's not a taxable event in either case because it's exchanging for certificates. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, got it. But that that secondary trust, the home trust, whatever you called it, um, can go to can go to the closing and and the, the, obviously they would have a bank account opened up to get the money out, and then they would just pay cash for the house. Yeah. And then. Um, so how would all the expenses of the house be taken care of? Could you exchange enough money to do that for, say, say let's just say 10 years of expenses, real estate taxes and all that. Can that be done at the same time? Sure. Oh, I just love your answers, honey. I mean, when it goes in, when it goes in to begin with, this initial exchange into the secondary trust that is non-taxable so you want to buy a million dollar house okay you're going to need to furnish that house you need to make property taxes you're going to landscape it you're right going to, so instead of taking out a million put in a million and a half got it i understand and then when you pay the expenses that's all you're doing you're it's still not a taxable event that's correct Whew, that's awesome i've got goosebumps that's so awesome <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about that? I hope I made it clear. Judy, we must be doing a really good job today. <laughs> I think it's all you, honey. <laughs> well, anyway, star six, if anybody has any questions, we're here. Okay. So anyway, so that is actually a second way. Oh, we do have a call here. Hang on a second. Hey. Charlene, how are you today? Hi, Carol. It's Nurse Charlie. You're Charlie. How are you doing, dear? Well, I'm actually doing well. I haven't had a time to even listen to the calls, but I'm home uh, for a little while and I have to go back to work. Now, I was uh, listening about the uh, house, and thank you for the caller that's asking those wonderful questions. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, if um, I was thinking you still have, uh, excuse me for shouting, I'm so tired. <laughs> you still you're fine, have, no, you're fine. You still have trust, uh, separate trust for houses, correct? Yeah. So yeah, but you're going, to, you're going to fund that separate trust with money from the first trust. So the first, you are not going to be investing, exchanging this time. The first trust is going to be exchanging. Okay. It's all paperwork. Believe me, it's easy. <laughs> I, I'm following that. Okay. So I'm thinking that I'm, I'm just going to the outline that you had. You had different trusts, like the, uh, to handle the maintenance and all those, but you don't have to have those. You no. You just use, okay. I mean, uh, uh, actually, you know, a client of mine did that diagram, the multi-trust diagram. Sometimes. I love it, though. <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, and it, oh, it's great. I mean, it, it helped out a lot of people. Mm -hmm. She did it. She's got these maintenance trusts in there because she and her husband are planning on buying several different properties. Mm -hmm. So they've got the maintenance trust that's going to pay for the maintenance on all those different properties rather than each one individually. Oh, okay. wow. That's what, I was, that's what I was thinking, too, because I would like to buy real estate. And you say that you could have, like, five houses in one trust. Is that correct? I would not recommend that. Oh, I thought just what you said. No, no. Yeah, I would keep each house in its own trust. You want to insulate and isolate everything as much as possible. Oh. So oh. Let's go back oh. to the very beginning, let's say go back to the very beginning when we talk about not having a trust at all. Mm -hmm. Everything you have is at risk if something happens. So carry this a little further. You have five houses in one trust. I say it's a rental. Somebody falls into the swimming pool or somebody trips up the stairs, mm -hmm. all those houses then are at risk if they try to sue you. Oh Where it's 
one house. So where did I get that idea from? I, I, I didn't read my notes before I called you, obviously, but I was under the assumption, making an ass out of you and me, you, me and me, <laughs> that you for one trust you could have up to five homes. Uh, no, so, I, don't, I don't know about that. Okay, well, I, you, you're the expert, so I, I, I misunderstood, so I'm glad I asked that question. So if you're, if you're planning, if one is planning on uh, purchasing a lot of real estate for rental for whatever, so each one, each house has to have a trust? That would be the best way to protect it, yeah. Mm. Now, if you're planning on real estate for rental, Absolutely. If you're planning it, but just flipping real estate, uh, that might be a different story. No. Yeah, because that's what I was going to ask you about flipping, or or just I'm I've lived in this house for five years and now I'm trying to move on and I sell that house. Then what happens to that that secondary trust? Yeah. Well, that secondary. Ha- I mean, you sell the house, the money goes into that trust. Okay. Okay. Because okay. the trust owns the house. Got it. Okay. Boy, am I glad I asked that question. So, so if you sell the house, the trust gets the money. Got it. Buy another house. Yeah, anything you sell out of, out of your trust goes back to the trust. Yeah. How do you yeah. close that out? If you Let's just fast forward and say it's a million dollars for the sake of the conversation. Sell so, and the million's in the trust, and Judy wants to... <laughs> so fast. <laughs> i got to keep up. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm listening. I'm just, sorry, I didn't understand what you said. No, you're just talking very fast. I was having a hard time. Oh, okay. Um, so, Carol, let's say that Judy, I use myself as the example, I purchased the property that I want for a million dollars in my second trust. Let's call it that, the second trust. And then a few years goes by and I sell it. The money's in the trust. How does Judy get the money out of that trust and let the trust go to bed? Or is that not a good idea? I wouldn't close out the trust because you may want to use it again sometime. Maybe you could let it be dormant, but I wouldn't terminate it. How would you get the million dollars out of it? Well, you guess like like we would do normally. You know, you could borrow, you can take a salary or draw, which is accessible to you. Okay. It's the same as your your regular trust, okay? Okay. Um, Different ways to get money out of the trust other than we just how we just talked about funding another trust to buy per property you know we can also do the loan like we talked about a moment ago right mm-hmm. salary or a draw but that is 1040 or 1099 income yeah. uh, okay. you, the trust can pay your expenses um, That's true. you know not just typical like telephone internet car expenses but business trips you know so the next time you go to the Caribbean or to Italy or to Spain, you know, make sure you look at some property, pick up some brochures, some business cards, right. you know, investigate some businesses. So let's the, make it be a real business trip, and the trust can pick up most of the expenses. And we've got a couple more callers here. Yeah. Anyway, well, good morning. Anyway, Hi, Carol. Hi. Yeah, uh, I had a question regarding the uh, the scenario you're just talking about. Um, Let's just say that scenario was, you know, the house has been sold and the trust is there with a million dollars. Um, can the, that very same trust be amended to buy another house and say, I don't want to take the money out. I want to buy another house. So it, what has, has to be done to that particular trust? Is it just amending the trust with a different uh, location, or how does that work? Yeah. Yeah, just, you know, the, the house has, you've written a minute that the house has been sold, the money's back in the trust. So then you decide, okay, I want to buy another piece of property. So the money's in the trust. That's how you pay for it. And we write a minute as to the legal description of the house, et cetera. And it will be titled okay. in the name of the trust. Got it. Okay, that, that's all. I just wanted to uh, – so it really, yeah, it makes sense to – even it is it, it is still dormant, it's still advisable to, to hang on to because that cause trust could be sitting there ready to um, – maybe, uh, you know, buy a house, not right now, but maybe a, a year or two down the road you want to. So it's a, it's, a, it's leverage, I guess. Exactly. Right, exactly. Excellent question, Thank you. Question, by All the right, way. Hey, uh, one more caller. Let's see. We've got um, Robert. Hi, I'm Carol. This is Clarice. Hi, 
how are you, Clarice? I'm good, thank you. Um, thank you so much for doing these calls. I wanted to ask a question about, I, I don't know, I guess I just feel um, really ignorant, but um, when you get a certificate, you say you divvy out a certificate and say it's, um, you know, 100000 to somebody, and how does it translate into cash or a check, and, you know, what's the basics in breaking that down? Okay, well, as we talked about certificates, yes, there are 100 units, and you can have, like, Currently, you have 50 and your husband has 50. But we're talking maybe down the road and you've named grandchildren or whomever, and somebody wants to make a distribution to the trust. Like I said, let's say, let's assume the trust has made a fair amount of money and, you know, everybody could use some money. So the trustee is going to declare a distribution. You know, it's, sort, it's similar to um, a corporation paying a dividend. No, I, I wrote that down and I got that, but I mean, like, how do you actually, like, okay, you have, you give this company or somebody a certificate, it's undeterminable amount. How do they take that to the bank and cash it or use it to get the actual fund? They don't. I mean, the, the I mean, the trustee has to make the determination, okay, we're going to make a distribution. The trustee okay. then writes a check to the certificate. Okay. Okay. For their, for their pro rata amount. Okay, okay, that's what I wondered. And so you kind of play the bank. So then you go, oh, oh, you don't even cash it or anything. You just write a check, and then they can. You write it to them, and then they go and cash it. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah, the certificate is their personal property, and they're never going to get rid of it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's their personal property. Even if there is a distribution made, they still own that certificate. You know, there might be another distribution made. So that, that is theirs until they do something with it, which they can do if they want to, or until they die. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Glad you could make it to the call. Oh, thanks. I, I still need to do my CD and read it and all the stuff I'm trying to. <laughs> Just been well, inundated. You better get working on it from what I'm hearing. I'm really, really close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's really, um, these calls are really informative um, for learning everything, so I really do appreciate all your patience and time put into this. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Okay. Anything else, Clarice? No. What do, how, do I cue, how do I cue back out? Are I just mute and... That's it? Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, Judy, you're up. Okay, great. So I'm curious about the business trust. Can it? I live in Virginia, which is a taxable state. Can it be domiciled in a tax-free state like Wyoming? Yeah, we do that. Actually, we do that all the time. Uh, we like Wyoming particularly because it's very easy. Uh, to register, because you know, there's no requirement to register a business trust there. So we send you to the box shop where we can, they can set you up with a street address. We use that street address when we obtain your EIN, and that validates that your domicile is actually in Wyoming. Uh, but people ask, well, is this legal? How can you do that? A corporations, trusts, LLCs have been domiciled in tax business friendly states for years. Um, you've all heard about Nevada. Do, right. Do that, and Delaware is also a very business-friendly state. Um, we used to actually send people to Nevada, but as Jim would say, Nevada shot themselves in the foot, to his mind, and mine as well, in that they started requiring business trusts to be treated somewhat like LLCs, and that they wanted a copy of the trust, they wanted to have registered agents, you wanted to pay an annual fee, et cetera, et cetera. So we have just decided um, we'll find a better place. And uh, Jim is actually the, folk, the one that found out about Wyoming, and that's a much better place for us. Okay, awesome. Um, d does banking, when we open bank accounts for these trusts, do they need to be in uh, the state where it's registered? Or can, like, can, I have my, can I have my bank account for my trust here in Virginia? Absolutely. Oh, perfect. You, know, you can open it personally. You can open a bank account anywhere. 
Okay. And you could probably be able to exchange anywhere. Actually, from what I read today, you could probably pick wherever you want to exchange. And your trust can do the same. You don't need to go to Wyoming to bank. You don't need to go to Wyoming to exchange. Wyoming is just a street address. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Okay, now, how do you effectively, yet kindly, deal with requests for money and urgent needs from people who weren't as fortunate as we are to get into this? Well, first of all, I would caution all of you, you're not going to broadcast your new found wealth to anybody. Oh, me, no way. Obviously, your friends and family are going to see that you've... um, um, Picked up some money somewhere along the way. You know, you're driving new cars, you've bought a new house, they're going to figure something's going on. But very simply, you know, all my assets are in trust. If anybody asks you where all this money come from, I have a long-term investment finally paid off. Which yeah, and it's true. all under trust, and I don't have access to it. Yeah, all my assets are in trust. All and my assets. Okay, I just wrote that down. All my assets are in a trust. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. Um, let me think now. What if you actually wish to gift or make a loan for an apparently legitimate need? Well, that's nice. I mean, it all depends how close you are to this person, et cetera, et cetera. If you just want to give your nephew $5,000 because you like him, that's one yes. thing. Well, Set up a loan him. with uh, – yeah. yeah. wants to borrow $50,000 instead of business. You start a business, that's another thing. But your your answer is always pretty much the same. Okay. We can take your request request to the trustees, and we'll inform you of their decision. So, well, you know, so if you I want to make a gift, an outright $14,000 gift to a friend um, that I've decided not to just hand foreign currency to, but I want to give her $14,000, can, can I do that, just a sure. gift? And the trustee would say giving a gift is okay, and it would be right a, a board of directors. You'd write a minute yeah, setting write a minute. it up. Yeah. But, it. I mean, you are the trustee. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so yeah. when we just say, you know, we take your request to the trustees, they don't necessarily have to know that you're the trustee. Yes, I understand that. Okay, <laughs> so on. Okay, cool. okay. Like, perfect. Like Clarice has another question here. Okay. Or she hasn't cleared yet. Okay, no, no, she just hasn't cleared yet, that's all. Okay. I, what happens to my business trust slash trusts when I die? Well, the business trust is born in contemplation of life, not death. You will pass, unfortunately. We all do. Mm-hmm. But when we, ask, when we prepare your trust, we ask you to name at least one successor trustee, and that person is the one that will take over when you die. I so see. No inheritance tax, no attorneys. The business trust is a life of 25 years that can be renewed at that 25 years by the trustees should they choose to do so. And all they have to do is write a minute. We want to keep it keep it going. Oh wow! I didn't know that. All these years I've known you, I did not know that. I didn't. I don't. I'm sure you told me, but I don't, didn't remember the 25 year <clears throat> thing. That's that's awesome. So then, that whoever's in charge at that time decides whether they want to. Let it go or renew it and keep it going. Exactly. Got it. Okay, so can I change a successor trustee due to unforeseen circumstances? Absolutely. That person can be changed at any time uh, for whatever reason. Um, okay. It could be you've named uh, your niece as successor trustee, and then you find out you know, six years down the road that your niece is hooked on heroin. Right, exactly. Or something like that. You can change it. Exactly. That's Just trustee. unfit to be the trustee in charge of all that money. Yeah. And also, you can provide for, okay, let's say your niece is going to be the trustee, but when your niece passes, maybe you don't want, certainly don't want her husband to take over because he's not part of your bloodline, so we can add a bloodline clause. Yeah, I want that bloodline clause in mind. And we can also say at the passing of the niece, so-and-so was to be your successor trustee, her successor trustee. So you can specify all that. And a lot of people have asked about spendthrift clauses. Um, There's a lot of talk out in Denarland about spendthrift trusts. 
which are typically grantor trusts, by the way, uh, statutory grantor trusts. But anyway, we can add a spendthrift clause so future trustees and certificate holders can't compromise or obligate the assets of the trust. So oh, God, that's a great idea. Okay. If you want those things, folks, if you want to name an additional future trust, future successor trustee, you want spendthrift, you want bloodline, you have to let me know. Okay. Do it. Okay. I okay. definitely want bloodline. I may already have it. You know, I don't know. I don't remember if you do or not. But we can I do don't that. either. Okay. What about, this is something to think about a lot because of my own personal family situation that has changed dramatically eight or nine months ago. And um, I'm serious. I need to look into obtaining legal or accounting help after the RV. Is that legal? Is that legal? Can I do that? Can I go hire a lawyer or accountant? You know, as, you know, as we talked about a little earlier, um, most attorneys and CPAs really aren't that familiar with business trusts because they're common law. Right. But if but, they get paid... Well, yeah. If they get, if you're going to tell them, oh, I'm going to pay you to do this, you just have to learn about it. Exactly. But, uh, Jim has done a, a really good job so far of locating attorneys and CPAs that oh, are only, they're not only familiar with business trusts, they're denarians. Oh, they're, they're oh my gosh. So, so once this happens, then we'll be able to get those names. Yes, they have asked us to to keep their privacy for right now because they realize their phones will be ringing off the hook with people that don't have any money. <laughs> right. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. So um, is it advisable to initially add other assets into our trust, like real estate, or um, along with the foreign currency, or do we do that later? Um, as, as Clarice just no, as uh, Nurse Charlie just asked about putting five houses into a trust, I would absolutely not do that and keep them separate. Right. As far as your mother load, let's just keep it at that. Put just okay. put your currency in your mother load, period. Okay, great. That's um, what I'm... And, you know, you could, you're going to want to do additional trust later on for real estate and possibly from other, you know, other assets. You may want to buy a Maserati and have it in its own trust, you know. Right. I don't, I'm not going right to be doing that. You want to keep your mother load just clean with just your currency. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, well, we hear, and I've heard this because I've been in this for 11 years now, and I've heard it from the beginning, and I hear it regularly, and it never changes, that um, keep each currency that we have separate but I think that's about bank accounts. I don't know that that means trusts. You're, a, you're absolutely correct. Uh, the important word here is account. Uh, one business trust can own several bank accounts, so the answer would be no, you don't need more than one trust. However, you can have additional ones if you want to set it up that way. And I have also read this uh, mostly, and actually I just read this again today, the only one that appears to it has to be should be kept separate is the dinar. Right. That's you're because have, you're going to have ABC Trust, but ABC Trust can have several bank accounts under it. So you want to keep right. the dinar separate from the other currencies. Right. That has to do with the fact that it's that when it's redeemed from Wells Fargo or HSBC, whichever bank, that means that because the it's going to go to the U.S. Treasury, the other currencies won't. That's what I understand. Yes. Yeah, that's mine too. Okay, so Miss Wonderful, what other planning services, estate planning services, do you provide? Well, Mo, thank you, Judy. Most of us, uh, most of you are aware that we do a triple play, and it is part of estate planning because estate planning is more than just taking care of the money. You need to take care of some other things because, as we talked about earlier, you're going to die at some point. Uh, you. You may get sick. You may be in the hospital. You may have a. You may be in a coma. You may be in an automobile accident. So we try to cover those things as well. So your children <clears throat> or your family won't be burdened with. Oh my God, what would Mom want me to do? So the triple play consists of a pour over will, and that simply says anything that you own personally at the time of your death, 
pours over into whichever trust you name. If you have more than one trust, you need to choose which one you want to put it into. Okay. And we also have durable power of attorney. So if for whatever reason you can't act on your own behalf, whether it's due to illness or you're out of the country, your appointed power of attorney has a legal right to to work for you on your behalf. And a health care director. Um, as most of us age, and we'll, we are all aging, uh, go to the hospital, even the doctor now, they ask you if you have a health care directive. Right. You can get one from the doctor, you can get one from the hospital, but they're pretty simple. And basically they say, yes, we have the right to, um, to take care of you. But the health care that we provide is, excuse me, it's much more definitive. You have a lot of choices to make. I do want, I want, I do not want, I want, I do not want. I have plans for this, I have plans for that. So it's, it's a very inclusive health care directive. Um, and I, I really think the triple play is, is important. Like I was say, it's more than, estate planning is more than just taking care of the money. Uh, you all know that Jim has had some issues uh, recently, and the triple play that we put in place for him has helped Judy tremendously. Uh, they, they went through this thing and, okay, we do this, I want this, I want this. Uh, it's all there in writing. You make those decisions yourself. So I think it's very reasonably priced at 275 for a single and 350 for a couple. And if you are interested in that, just give me a call or drop me an email. And that's about all of our prepared questions for today. Does anybody have any additional questions? We've got a few minutes left to go. Judy, anything on your mind other than? No, I'm good to go here. I'm processing some of these later. Bloodline thing is important to me. I, I've always, I've always, I've always thought that was my estate planning for my whole adult life. You just, there's just, there are too many divorces. That, you know, I don't want my what I've worked so hard to leave my granddaughter or grandson to go to an ex. So that a bloodline, I think that's something we all, as adults with children and grandchildren, we all should give that a lot of serious consideration. That's my personal opinion. I totally agree. Absolutely. Um, one of our clients was on a call a couple months ago, and she related a story about um, the mom moving in with her daughter and new son-in-law. And no, the daughter and the new son-in-law moved in with the mom in her fully paid-for house. Put the son-in-law in charge, who sold the house and kicked her out. Oh, oh boy, that hurts. Yeah. Oh yeah, That's it's hurtful. So... I mean, it's hurtful even to hear about. Oh but, my you know, those God. Those are things, folks, that we need to be aware of. I mean, there are some bad actors out there, and yes, we want to, you know, if they, you know, they'll come into our families. That, that happens, but we can at least protect our assets from charlatans like that. We need wow. to do the best we can to do that. Looks like we have another call. Uh, Nurse Charlie, you're back. Oh, I was wondering, uh, um, with the trust, I have the two trusts, and my dilemma is, Carol, and I know I'm just, I just need some guidance on when we exchange, uh, how do we break, how would you suggest I know you're going to tell me it's up to me, but how do you suggest that we break it down to each trust and we want more in the mother load? Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You want to keep the bulk of it in your mother load. You know, your secondary trusts, you may, you know, and that, well, that's, a good, that's a really good question because I don't know how this is going to occur. I don't think anybody does. Uh, in right. in our own case, you know, my husband and I obviously have more than one trust. I don't know that we're going to be able, at the time of the exchange, to designate what goes here and what goes here and what goes here. Other right. than, as we talked about a little while ago, the dinar has to be into a separate bank account. I don't know that we're going to be able to exchange into multiple trusts at the time of the exchange. Wow, that's so interesting. It has been suggested that we set up pass-through accounts, meaning, so let's, let's say we go back to ABC Trust. ABC Trust is your mother-in-law, but you want to put right. this trust and this trust and this trust. 
you're going to set up a pass-through account. So after your initial exchange, you'll be able to pass the money from one, from one trust to another without it being a taxable event because it was, it was set up as a pass-through to begin with. How do you do that? I think you just say, I want to set up a pass-through account. Oh, okay. So then after, for, and, you know, from other calls I've listened to and other things that I've read, our initial exchange may be an hour, hour and a half. Right. And, you know, we don't, obviously do not want to be rushed through it. But there's still going to be a lot of questions that we have. We are probably more than likely going to be meeting with wealth managers shortly after the exchange. If we go to Wells Fargo, I'm sure they're going to uh, refer us to Abbott Downing. And they're probably going to have wealth managers there for us to meet at the time. Mm -hmm. And if they assign somebody to us, and they probably will, that doesn't mean that's cast in stone. Right. If we don't like them, we say, I, need, I want another referral. Exactly. Or you find somebody else. I mean, yeah, that a, happened lot people, with Wells Fargo. a lot of people have been interviewing wealth managers now. Um, yeah, I've, I've already done that. And I, yeah. I've, I've, I've been in. Oh, my God. I got it. Is it all right if I tell this little story? Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I went through a protracted acrimonious divorce several years ago, and the, our primary residence was sold, and the uh, equity in the house, which was substantial, was um, divided between us. And so I contacted Wells Fargo, which is where I had banked forever, to tell them that I had this uh, deposit coming in and what day it was coming in. And so my private banker this wonderful woman who I love and adore, who I've actually given dinar to, uh, in her quest to help me, she gets a, a wealth manager to come in and talk to me, this guy who, oh, my God, he, he, a, he was so dismissive of this private banker woman, and then he treated me like I was an 80-year-old crippled woman telling me I needed to buy long-term health care. I needed to consider going into nursing care. I, I, I told my wealth manager, I said, don't ever mention his name to me again. Don't you contact him and you tell him, don't, he never, he's never to contact me again. It's some people you don't click with. You, I'm not going to let somebody tell me what to do like that, that I don't, I have no regard for. So well, back to my question. Okay. Uh, so when we when we do our exchange, so we put everything into uh, of our currencies uh, into the mother load and ask for a pass through account. Is that what you what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. If we do, if we do not have the opportunity to exchange into more than one trust, and as I, say, I don't know, I don't no. know we what don't know. the scenario will be. If you can exchange to both, then you need to determine. Okay, I'm going to put. 90% of it my mother load and 10% of it into the other one because I want to buy a house or however you, whatever your plan, are, plan is. However, if you cannot do that or you haven't made those kind of decisions yet, make sure that you do set up pass-through accounts. Tell them I want a pass-through account because I'm going to pass this money into another trust account soon. Okay, Okay. This and, is the bank account you're talking about, Jim, right? What about the walk-around money that Jim was talking about? Because I was just, would that be a, a, a different? Oh, well, just, Jim early on was talking about, you know, cashing in one or two 25K notes for walk-around money, okay? Right. But as mm -hmm. I said, I don't know that we're going to have the opportunity to do that. All those things, yeah. yeah. We as the Internet group are probably – going to be aware of this exchange before it's made public. Right. So in that case, we probably not have that opportunity to exchange a couple of notes ahead of time. Okay. So if I have a pass-through account, uh, to, then I, that's how I will get my extra money that I need to walk around with. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But with the pa okay, so with the mother load account, we do not have a uh, uh, – we don't write checks or anything from that, or we don't ha even have a card for that. That's correct, right? Yeah. You know what you said? Yep. Okay. So with our uh, pass-through uh, account, will we be able to get checks for that? Yes. Or, well, not checks, but a card. Will they yeah, sure. offer us a card? Mm-hmm. A card and uh, checks are now. 
Yeah. Um, what I'm yeah. going to do after this call is I mentioned earlier that I got a really good email today, and part of that email was tips on what to do at your exchange. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell everybody right now, I'm going to send you that if you don't want oh, to. Oh, yay. Thank you, open. Carol. But I am going to send you that, it's just tips for, for exchange, and I think they're pretty good ideas. So Okay. Thank you so much. I apologize for not being on more calls, but I work. So, well, I, everybody works, but, you know, I've, I work terrible hours, oh, so no I, I might be repetitious the questions. And, and uh, another thing, one more thing, uh, a, a person, I'll put it that way, said that our trusts are uh, mm, like 39%, I think it was like 39 point something percent taxable. How could that, how can that be? The trust that we sell. Will mm-hmm. save you. It's not money to save you on taxes. It will save you on estate taxes and inheritance taxes at your death. Okay. But as far as regular income tax, there's not a real big tax benefit here, other than what you can write off in expenses. It pays the same rate as a married couple filing jointly. Okay. So when I domiciled in Wyoming, that's just to prevent me from state tax, correct? That's correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. How do I go oh, to me? So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, if I, oh, that, that, so my, the whole thing is going to be taxed at 39 point, whatever it is in California. The earnings. Okay. If, if you're in California, uh-huh. this, this goes back to our very first comment. Nobody knows if this is going to be taxable or not. And some That's say true. yes, some say no. And the most recent thing I heard was it's not going to be taxable either at the federal level or the state level. So who knows? Right. So, I mean, I, I wish I could be more clear on that. No, but that's I don't fine. Have <laughs> and that's, that's thanks to our President Trump, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> we won't even talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that, that helps me so much, Carol. Um, I'll go back through my notes, too, because I had another question, but I didn't know I was going to be able to be on this call. But probably what you're going to send is it's going to answer all of those questions. That I, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. And how is Jim? Jim's doing a lot better. He's um, Physically, he's doing a lot better. Okay. His memory is still playing tricks on him. Oh, dear. So, so um, we, yeah. I mean, he will get over it. He had brain surgery. So oh, I didn't know. Over. See? Yeah. Oh, oh my jeepers. But he's oh. coming back. He's coming back. Oh, praise God. Well, we'll keep him in prayer for that. Okay, Carol, thank you so much. And thank, thank you to you, the Shirley. callers as well. And by the way, one more thing. I heard our, our trust being blasted really badly by somebody. I didn't, I didn't pipe in. I left it alone. <laughs> Something's been done, done, done. Yeah, I, I don't am, know. I've heard about her, yes. I, I've chosen to ignore her. She's um, yeah. She's got some issues of her own, so. Yeah, but uh, she was uh, probably one of the first ones. But I like our trust. I love it, and I'm just so happy to have it. So Thank I you. need to get that triple pay. You say it's 275 Yes. Okay, and uh, the bloodline, how much is that? Did, just tell me about it, and I'll add it to the. Okay, to the okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so care. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, what a sweet caller. Yeah. Clarice, you're up. Oh, hi. Um, Carol, I wanted to ask you, um, when you were talking about opening the bank accounts under the trust, because I'm about to do that again soon here, and so um, besides asking for non-interest bearing, Um, I'm going to be asking for a non-interest bearing pass-through account and three different ones. Three different ones? I'd say one for each currency, I should say. Uh, Well, the the only currency you really have to keep separate is the dinar. uh, Right. Okay. You're just going to want to make sure you have pass-through accounts so you can take the money out of your mother load and put it into something else. Right, but I need to request, um, so because when we do the exchange, you want to have um, those account numbers, and so I would need to request at least two then at a minimum 
um, of different um, bank accounts. You need to record them. I don't understand. Oh, uh, well, like, okay, when I go and open a trust um, bank account, um, I just get one account number, and it's for the checking, and um, I believe it has a checking and a savings that went under it. But if I'm needing to have more than one, since I have to have this pass-through type of account, then I need to request that besides opening the trust account under it, I need to have two accounts and with a pass-through feature to it. Yes, I believe that's Is that correct. what you think? Mm-hmm. Okay. I have to ask him for two accounts. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Well, Judy, I think that brings us to the end of our call. I want to thank you so much for your help today. My pleasure, Carol. It's always a pleasure. I, ho- I want everybody to give you a hand and say thank you for all you do for all of us. You are one amazing person, and I love you dearly, and I respect you, and I'm sure everybody else does as well. So I'm going to clap. Can you hear me? There you go. (laughs) Everybody. Thank you. All right, doll. Have a great and glorious day, and say hi to Jay. I will. Thank you. And okay, honey. Bye bye for now. all that our business trusts are priced at only fourteen ninety five for new clients and eleven ninety five for additional trusts or family members. And as most of you know, we also offer a twenty percent referral fee for any fully paid new trust. I want to thank you all for your attendance and attention, and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Again, this is Carol Worlius. My telephone number is four two five eight two zero eight zero nine zero. And my email is info at indicator, I-N-D-I-C-A-T-O-R, information.com. Thanks again, everybody. I will send out that email as soon as we get off the phone. And we'll probably talk to you next week. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carol. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.